Hello everyone, I am Shigenao Ishiguro, President and CEO of the TDK Global Corporation, and I am proud today to be able to join TDK Ventures to welcome all of you to the first inaugural Energy Week on behalf of our hosts and our partners. Throughout our 86-year history, TDK has existed to build a more sustainable world and pursue a vision of technology for the betterment, well-being, and happiness of everyone. Since our origins in ferrite materials and magnetic tapes to the modern innovation of today, the technologies required to progress humanity and answer the call of sustainability has rapidly evolved. At present, humankind is faced with its greatest challenge yet. We have pressing need for energy transformation, the right energy transformation. With fossil fuels accounting for over 80% of the world's total energy generation, we have a long way to go together. TDK is committed to answering this call for change progress, and innovation through action. In organizing Energy Week, I'd like to commend TDK Ventures for their commitment to this transformation and for bringing in TDK goodness to accelerate our contribution to society and to the planet. They continue to push the envelope for energy transformation most evident by the choice in investment and in their constant drive to support and encourage the energy community as a whole. I wish to thank every one of you, the engineers, the scientists, the entrepreneurs and the venture capitalists for taking part and contributing to the innovation ecosystem. Energy Week cannot be a success and drive the innovations our world needs without a standing response that you all have already demonstrated. It is all of you and your same commitment to this cause that will bring about true sustainability and the right energy transformation. To conclude, and with a sincere appreciation, hope, and optimism, I wish you all the warmest of welcomes and look forward to witnessing the meaningful action and outcomes coming out of this TDK Venture First Energy Week. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. I'm honored to welcome you to the first session of TDK Ventures Energy Week 2021 conference. We're covering topics related to energy transformation, or as we call it as EX. This event is hosted by us at TDK Ventures, which is the corporate venture capital arm of the Japanese electronics giant TDK Corporation. Next slide, please. My name is Anila Chuta. I'm an investment director at TDK Ventures, and I I lead our investments in energy, material science, and health tech. And so far, I'm an investor in nine outstanding deep technology companies. I will be moderating our session today. And please note, there are four other events upcoming in the Energy Week throughout this week. So please do tune in and register according to your interest. We care about energy transformation, and we have made 18 investments in deep tech companies in a little more than two years, many in the energy, mobility, and material science spaces, all relevant to EX. I will be moderating our session today. Like every other session in Energy Week, we have designed our panel to be with thought leaders representing academia, industry, entrepreneurs, and the investment community. We feel strongly about this diversity in each panel. We believe this is what will give us an opportunity for real meaningful actions. Next slide, please. Today, our conversation will be around electrification, specifically around mobility-related technologies 
battery manufacturing, and the importance of material science and processing in the broader adoption of EVs. I'm thrilled to welcome world-class scientists, entrepreneurs, and VCs to our panel, whom I'll be introducing in a bit. Next slide, please. Again, a huge thank you to all of our panelists, and I cannot wait to get some in discussion going on today in, on today's topics. But first, let me review the agenda for you today, as well as some of the background on the topics we'll be exploring and how you, the audience, will be engaging in today's conversation. After the quick intro by yours truly, we go into an 80 minutes of in-depth discussion with audience engagement focused on two high-level starter questions. And we'll finish with 30 minutes of open Q&A with questions from you. So please have your cell phone ready to scan QR codes or just have an open survey link we will uh, share in the chat so you can join us with the polling tool we will be using to gather your feedback. Next slide, please. We're seeing electrification from almost all major OEMs today. Battery technologies from the most crucial component of this electrification plan in order to decrease range anxiety, reduce cost, and even uh, have more environmentally friendly and safe technologies. Hence, battery materials manufacturing is a core part of our discussion today. Next slide, please. As a CVC firm, we at TDK Ventures have seen over several, several hundred companies now in the last two and a half years. On the cathode materials, we see that high nickel lithium rich oxides are proposed as the most promising high energy density solutions, while LFP chemistry being the cheaper and safer proposals. On the anode side, we have seen several silicon and lithium anodes as being the most exciting and prolific innovations, while both having some challenges with volumetric changes, dendritic growth, and mass manufacturability challenges. Next slide, please. We're also seeing a revolution in solid state technologies, even with higher densities and safer technologies. Machine learning and AI is driving the discovery of new electrolytes. We see mass manufacturing, contact loss, and lithium propagation as some of the key challenges in this space. We're also seeing an array of innovations in the dry electrode manufacturing technologies, um, also some innovation in 3D printing space applied to the battery manufacturing and making lower carbon footprint electrodes and higher density electrodes. Next slide, please. So which of these technologies have the highest impact to OEMs? Which of them will penetrate the market faster? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, following slide. Thank you. Today, I'm delighted to introduce our amazing round of panelists from academia, industry, startups, and from the venture community. I'm truly humbled by everyone's presence here, and I'm looking forward to our stimulating conversation. Our first guest is an amazing academic entrepreneur, a material scientist by training, and has over 160 publications to her name. She's the founding director of Sustainable Power and Energy Center, a full professor at UCSD, and an academic entrepreneur. She's also the founder of Unigrid, a grid scale energy storage company. Please welcome Shirley Meng as a panelist. Welcome, Shirley. Hello. Our second guest has over 42 years of experience in developing and commercializing battery technologies, specifically known for his tremendous contributions towards the lithium ion revolutions at one of the largest cell makers in the world, CATL. Please help me welcome Bob Gellion. Welcome, Bob. Hello. Thank you, Anil, for inviting me. Thank you. Our third guest is Sarah Chamberlain, who specialized commercial activity with solar, smart grid, energy storage, and advanced mobility. She's now the founding member of Energy Foundry, who have truly spearheaded many amazing seed investments, including a portfolio company that we've invested together with, Span.io. Please welcome Sarah Chamberlain. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having Hi, me. Sarah. Our fourth guest is my top three best deep tech investors in the world, who's backed some iconic companies such as Tesla, SpaceX, QuantumScape, Joby Aviation, 
redwood materials, form energy to name a few. Most of us in the venture capital community hope that one of our companies is as successful as these, but Depender has several of them, dozens of them. Please help me welcome Depender Saluja. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you, Depender. Our fifth guest is an entrepreneur and a surface engineering and a deposition expert who develops the most intricate surfaces for lithium ion batteries for fast charging and better in energy density. Erlene Dameron is the VP of R&D and for, of, for, at Forge Nano, and she has over 60 publications and patents. Erlene? Hi, Welcome. thank you so much. Thank you. Unfortunately, our sixth guest could not make it today due to a family emergency. We wish Michael the very best. And our last guest, but not the least, is an academic entrepreneur and one whom I've had the distinct pleasure to work with directly in two of my investments, Dr. Yen Wang. Yen is one of the hardest working scientists I know and is the co-founder of Battery Resourcers, which is a lithium ion recycling company and AM Batteries, which is a dry electrode technology company. Plus he's a full-time professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Please welcome Yen Wang. Hi, everyone. Hi, Anne. Very nice to have you here. Now let's get the session started. Dear panelists, please see the link in the chat on the right-hand side of your screen and click through to submit your answer to what you think is the most meaningful innovation to be realized in the next five years in the battery materials processing manufacturing industry. All right, we're, we have about one minute left here and uh, we've got silicon anodes, we've got solid state batteries, and uh, we've got a, a whole lot of interesting um, technologies. Wow, dry coating, uh, dry processing, transformative manufacturing being uh, another innovation that's being proposed. We have about 32 seconds. Uh, we're hoping to get a couple more answers from our panelists here. And uh, while all of them seem to be very exciting, uh, wow, we've got a nice detailed answer here. Reduce drying power needs of wet electrodes. Yeah, absolutely. Coating materials, modifications, uh, for sure. Uh, we have about five seconds left and um, would love to get any more answers. All right, the poll is closed now. Shall we bring uh, all the panelists back to our screen here? Thank you very much for taking the time to poll. Uh, very interesting answers. Uh, perhaps we can uh, um, go with uh, the top person I see on the screen. Uh, uh, shall we start with Bob? Uh, Bob, what, what was your answer? And uh, help us uh, understand your answer. I'm a bit of a radical, Anil. I didn't see the answer that I was looking for, and that's uh, printing technology, because I, uh, although I do like the uh, idea of the dry coating process, I do believe that the printing technology is going to be one that's going to be a front runner for future revolutionary type of uh, uh, technology in making electrodes. Excellent, excellent. Uh, maybe uh, perhaps we can hear from uh, Depender next, and uh, actually, uh, Bob, we would love to actually double click on that and uh, maybe go <laughs> a little deeper. But let's hear out from everyone, and then uh, we can just have uh, have a little more dynamic discussion there. Depender. So, so you know, uh, this is like asking to choose from, you know, your favorite children. Um, uh, this is such a such a big opportunity space. Uh, uh, I think forcing folks to pick one is obviously a way to keep it short, uh, but there's so many things I can think of. So you asked me for the most important one, and I would say all encompassing would be solid state batteries in general. And the reason for that is, is uh, you know, very simple for me. I think, you know, there are many things we can do with batteries and energy storage. Uh, obviously, you know, consumer electronics around us have enjoyed the benefit of that, power tools have enjoyed the benefit of that, but the big prize really is replacing uh, 
uh, fossil fuels uh, with energy storage. And fossil fuels are dominant in transportation and uh, uh, other applications and transportation being the biggest of them, uh, you know, where we have hundreds of millions of vehicles uh, that uh, uh, can get electrified in the coming uh, coming years and decades. And so uh, the path to that without, you know, a, a no compromise path to that would be with solid state batteries. And that's why I think that is what is, uh, is the most important and hopefully we will see them here in the near future. Uh, uh, maybe just to expand on that, why solid state? Uh, it's because, you know, if you were designing something to replace gasoline from scratch, you would want higher energy density, which is uh, very important. You would want high power density. You would want long cycle life. It would have to be safe, that is paramount and then everything gets driven by cost. And so as opposed to address one of those things, which we've done a great job with a lot of existing cell chemistries and architectures, and thank God for that, which is why we're enjoying uh, a, a, a lot of uh, progress here already, uh, but to really hit those five things uh, out of the park, if you may, to get to where you can truly replace gasoline and not feel like you're compromising would would be something that we would get from from solid state batteries very nice really appreciate it uh maybe we can double click on that as well later on uh shirley yeah so my top choices is actually based on transformative manufacturing uh, on the dry processing so regardless what are the technologies that we are going to end up with i mean the current uh, lithium ion technologies can also benefit greatly from the um, new way of doing manufacturing. As we know, uh, United States already lost the race for the uh, manufacturing for the current lithium ion batteries. Uh, and if anybody who have been making the battery yourself, like what I do with my students over the last uh, two decades, um, there's a lot of toxic solvents and a lot of um, um, chemicals that involved uh, in the process that uh, I do believe that uh, the engineers, uh, we can make it much more simplified and uh, much more energy efficient and much more sustainable. So I do think uh, regardless if we're moving towards lithium metal batteries or solid state batteries in the next decades, uh, lithium ion technology is here to stay. So let's not forget that, uh, uh, you know, we still have a lot of um, space to improve uh, in terms of improving the carbon footprint of today's lithium ion technologies. So that's the reason I picked the dry process in transformative manufacturing. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, when the next 100 gigawatt factories are being built, uh, I sincerely hope we will build it in the with a new perspective of uh, low carbon footprint and the sustainability. Thank you for your very, very insightful answer. Uh, Sarah? So I, I agree first off with Depender that we love all our children equally and Energy Foundry sees about, just to put in context, about a thousand now this year, 1400 with everything being virtual, about 1400 companies a year. And then we have that thankless job of zeroing in to the, the five that are investable. And in energy storage, we've actually made quite a few different bets. We have a silicon anode company called Nanograph. We have a um, cathode coating technology that enables cobalt-free high nickel chemistries called Valexian. And we have a grid scale long duration storage company called e which is a totally new chemistry. So I think there's a number of different ways. And, and especially as you think about materials platforms, materials in general are just so challenging to commercialize. And if you're inventing a new material, it's a much different cycle from technology development and commercialization than if you're enhancing <clears throat> an existing material. So we look at it really from that perspective. I think if I look at the next five years, what has real viability to come to market and can have some impact, I think silicon anodes are on the horizon, um, mostly because there are a number of companies that have been really 
working on this for seven, eight, 10 years in the trenches, pulling the technology through, working with customers, getting to manufacturability and scale. And so that investment over the last five to seven years is now going to be realized and come to fruition, especially as more and more capital is coming to the table to support manufacturing. And as the automakers really make a significant commitment to electrification of their fleets. So I'll say, I'll say silicon anodes, but in the, at the end of the day, you know, cathodes are also close to my heart. And I look forward to seeing how some of those technology roadmaps can move into solid state and some of the things that uh, Shirley is talking about in terms of innovative processing. Thank you very much again. Um, really, really appreciate it. Uh, Yen? Yeah, thank you, Anil. So in the past, like uh, 20, 30 years, like uh, so industry, I would say both industry and the academic uh, mainly focus on the research and development or innovation on the material science. And uh, now if we see uh, the lithium battery industry, we do have a, a few good options like uh, MC cathode materials, lithium phosphate, et cetera, for the cathode and uh, also different anode materials. So however, converting those uh, good materials into batteries, like the final products, uh, I think material manufacture uh, is critical and also will play an even bigger role in the next uh, maybe five, 10 years. And uh, also if we see today's battery cost, like to, uh, roughly 25% from manufacturing. And also if you look closely for those different manufacturer type, like drying, solvent recovery, and uh, uh, formation, aging, those steps mainly contribute to the cost, the energy, and the et cetera. And also we have to remember like a manufacturer not only allow us to enable like a lower cost, lower energy consumption, lower carbon footprint, and they can also potentially enable better batteries. You know, like um, for example, and uh, one of my startup companies is called AM Batteries. We do a dry printing technology for electrode. And when I talk to potential investors, at least like two or three uh, companies or corporate ventures, they are not just interested in the for current uh, lithium battery electrode manufacturing. They are actually interested in using the technology for solid state batteries. Yeah, that's why I say maybe the manufacturing, especially dry printing, dry coating, those probably will play a key role uh, in the next five years. Thank you very much, Ian. Really appreciate your answer as well. Uh, we next have Arlene. Uh, maybe it's just because I'm last, but I'm going to somehow simultaneously agree and disagree with everyone all at the same time, or at least I'm going to I'm going to try and navigate this story. Um, you know, based on the question, uh, I really focused on the the to be realized in the next five years. And if we consider that it takes two to three years to stand up any factory to the point where you can produce a, a you know, working battery, um, you're really talking about pretty near-term near -term, near -term goals. And so I think from my perspective, it's innovations which can reduce CapEx and, Apo and, and OpEx costs, which Yan was just talking about and uh, Shirley. Um, dry processing, reducing formation requirements, and formation equipment. Um, anything that we can implement on the front end of battery production to help with recycling, because please let's set ourselves up to make this energy transformation um, more environmentally mentally friend friendly than the last one. Coatings, I'm maybe a little bit biased towards coatings, but coatings are materials modifications to, that can enhance capacity or durability to extreme charge discharge use um, and enable a, not necessarily a longer battery lifetime, but we should probably dive into later how you do materials development while you're simultaneously trying to develop reliability and QC, um, but more enabling the use of the same type of materials for longer uh, manufacture. Um, because changing out tooling uh, to enable other newer materials is, is challenging once you have a factory up. And then I also think about uh, materials that can be used immediately in any current battery facility that we have or upgrading materials um, with minimal downstream process impacts um, or lifetime impacts. 
Um, and then finally, um, innovations that uh, we can implement on the manufacturing side to make things simple and successful. If we learned anything during COVID, you know, our labor force um, has has some holes in it, and we need um, we don't have a, a labor force that's trained for battery manufacturing yet. We have to develop that as well. Um, so anything that can be automated or just needs, you know, somebody to watch the process um, that has less moving parts or is just simpler to maintain um, and anything at all on either material side or the processing side that can, that can drive yield um, higher. Those would be like the manufacturing process improvements that I would choose to focus on in, in the near term rather than a single technology because there's so many great technologies they already listed many of them. Thank you very much. And you, I'm assuming you had the long answer in, in uh, amongst all the other ones. Perhaps. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to like uh, uh, call myself out, but I, I might have had you know a couple more words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, no, no, that's uh, certainly uh, very valuable for all of us. Uh, maybe I'll start uh, from from Shirley. Shirley, you said uh, something very interesting. I want to double click. You said. Uh, we, we've lost the uh, sort of the manufacturing race. Uh, can you a little, uh, elaborate a little bit more on, on, on why you think that has happened and how we can now change to, to make it better? Yeah, I think just from academic perspective, I think, uh, you know, our expert panels um, in the panel, you know, perhaps Bob is the better person to comment that the gigawatt factories, I think uh, 90 of them are in Asia. And there's a reason for that. You know, first of all, I think the strong commitment from the government played a key significant role in enabling that. You know, as, as we know that uh, uh, the gigawatt factories upfront, the capital investment is huge. Um, and, uh, you know, the risk is high and the uh, uh, workforce development as well. I think, uh, you know, these, all these things really need the commitment uh, uh, beyond just, you know, academic research and uh, uh, startup companies and even, you know, uh, companies like, uh, um, uh, you know, I would uh, using the U.S. example is the A123, you know, uh, even though, you know, we see a very rapid rise of A123. However, at some point, uh, we decide to give up. So I I know I'm, you know, being recorded. Of the, it is it, just uh, describing what happened uh, in the last decade. So um, this time, if we're going to do it, let's do it right. Uh, it's really my sincere hope that uh, you know, um, when we think about uh, uh, producing and using batteries, the users are right here in the United States. There are so many people who would like to experience EV and who would like to have a high-performance car at the same time, do good to the environment. So we know that the battery manufacturing and the, the deployment should happen where the customers are. I think, uh, you know, even though I'm not a business trained person, I think that's a simple fact that everybody should realize. So that's why, you know, I hope, uh, you know, really that uh, uh, when we build the next 100 gigawatt factory for the world, uh, a fair share of those gigawatt factories will be located in North America and the Europe because we have so many customers here. Um, Bob, can I call out the Bob to yes, add on please. a few comments? This is supposed to be very interactive, <laughs> absolutely. Well, Shirley, Shirley has the advantage. We were on a, a conference call earlier today and uh, this topic came up. And one of the biggest questions I get since I've been back from seven and a half years working at CATL was why were the Chinese battery manufacturers so successful and I, I attribute it to four key success factors. Number one was available technology. The technology was already there. When I arrived, the technology was there. All they had to do was put it into practice and manufacturing. The second was available capital. China had a lot of money that was pouring in from other avenues and the people that were investing in battery companies made their money off of other uh, technologies and poured it into energy storage because they saw that as a great opportunity. The third key area was government support. The government did it at the federal level, the provincial level, even at the city level by creating incentives for the car 
companies to and the bus companies to make vehicles that would have a certain incentive package as well as giving people license plates so they could drive their car into town every day and free and available uh, charging stations. And then the fourth is a double uh, 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 pronged uh, point, and that is having the trained people and having the equipment. We had to train our people to become battery manufacturing folks, and we also had to design and then we would farm out the, the equipment to big industrial companies to make the equipment after we had designed it. So those were the four key elements, I think, that Shirley was asking me to comment on. Really appreciate that perspective. Uh, thank you for that. And um, maybe, uh, Bob, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with you. Um, okay. You did mention about uh, the printing technologies and the 3D printing, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. Can you please elaborate on, on uh, why you think those would be uh, the most attractive ones in the next five years? Well, I believe that the printing technology affords you the opportunity to print not only the active material, but a combinatorial type of technology of conductive uh, lattice or matrix within that active material at the same time. Uh, you can also basically print somewhere between three and five times the thickness of the coating thicknesses that we're making today with traditional uh, doctor blade coatings. Uh, this is one of the reasons I feel it's favorable. The other thing is that you can put a different blend of different types of active materials together in a single electrode, whereas typical mixing processes make that somewhat difficult. Although I'm not an expert in, in uh, the dry coating process, uh, Yan Wang uh, certainly is, and maybe he has comments on that point. But the printing, the printing technologies, I think, are going to afford us uh, quite a, a variety of technologies in doing 3D printing as well. You can print in odd shapes, you can print in uh, uh, different thicknesses, and you can actually print in different strata. So you can literally coat the electrodes with different densities of materials at each layer that you're adding to it. So I believe that this is the next uh, major revolution and it works both for a liquid state type of battery as well as a solid state battery. So those are the reasons, Anil, that I'm uh, very high on printing technology. Thank you, Bob. Really appreciate that uh, perspective. Uh, maybe Dipender, uh, one question for you is, uh, uh, how come uh, our panelists are uh, so interested in the dry processing technologies and manufacturing technologies and hasn't, but, but, but the venture community hasn't really uh, uh, invested a whole lot in, in this space. Uh, it seems like uh, Maxwell's uh, uh, technology is really the one that, that's uh, been adopted by Tesla and certainly being put to use, uh, still more work to do, of course, but uh, it seems like... Uh, the venture community is uh, there's a little bit of a lag uh, in, in in the from the venture side. Can you give us a little bit more uh, color on on how you're thinking about this? Sure. So um, first of all, I think I wholeheartedly agree with the importance of manufacturing. At the end of the day, all of this is going to be meaningful only if we can make it and make it at a cheap cost, make it reliably, and make lots of it. Uh, uh, I was on a panel. Uh, a few weeks ago where another uh, prominent academic uh, uh, made the comment that he could see uh, us getting into a period where we need one gigafactory a day. Uh, I haven't done the math with him on it, but you know he made that statement that he didn't talk about the period. But all that to say that this is all coming um, at us fast and we need a lot of manufacturing capacity. So manufacturing is very, very important. Uh, like I said at the beginning, you forced us to pick one area, right? And so uh, you kind of tied our hands. But um, uh, I, I would say, you know, if you just expand it to the top 10 things or top five even, I would say, yeah, manufacturing is going to be really important. Um, from a venture point of view, uh, there are a few things that uh, are interesting from a manufacturing point of view. Um, it just becomes a question of, you know what will be in that venture timeline and where does where do venture dollars really play that role as you and i've discussed 
you know, not everything is 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 suitable for venture dollars. Uh, not good or bad. It's just you know where do where do venture dollars play? So for manufacturing, where we've been investing our time and effort is in some of the things that uh, some of the others talked about. We spent a fair amount of time time trying to encourage policymakers uh, to put policies in place uh, that would encourage manufacturing and manufacturing rapidly. Um, uh, And not just in one geography, but multiple geographies. If we take um, solar as a good example over the last 15 years, one of the reasons we're all enjoying the benefits of solar having become one of the cheapest forms of electricity now is that several regions competed to get into that manufacturing. Obviously, one region won by far, but it was not the region that got the party started. Uh, the manufacturing of solar uh, started in Europe, uh, and then the, the Europeans created a market, and then a lot of Asian uh, manufacturers rushed to fill that, and therein started that creative destruction that uh, uh, then led to uh, uh, incredibly low prices and uh, and the volumes uh, that have become so important. So, uh, all that to say, manufacturing is very important. Um, uh, venture community, uh, you know, is obviously picky about what areas their dollars are 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 good for, but we continually look for good manufacturing technologies. In other areas of uh, of storage, which we'll talk about hopefully in the 10-year outlook, uh, we are doing stuff in, in manufacturing. For example, the whole the whole area around hydrogen, um, you know, how, how that is manufactured and made is going to be a very important piece as well. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Dipender, for your uh, point of view here. Um, and Sarah, I think I, I heard you say one thing. Uh, um, I heard you mention about uh, um, materials and materials innovations having uh, uh, a much harder time uh, in, in, in commercializing. Can you give us a little more color on, on, uh, on uh, why you think so and, and how we can, as, as a community, entrepreneurial support community, uh, we can encourage and make this uh, easier and better for entrepreneurs? Sure. And I think just even to build on some of the previous comments, you know, part of why it's so challenging is because you have to find a way to engage with kind of two different sides of the value chain, particularly in energy storage. Um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't really want to have to go build a plant that requires new equipment and new processing techniques that folks are not familiar with. They want to engage with the existing ecosystem, whether that means the feedstock suppliers who are already embedded with those battery OEMs or the end customers. And so um, it's very challenging to do that and to have the proof points where you can then be taken seriously. And to the question on, you know, how, how and where will we begin to see more venture activity and manufacturing innovations? Part of that is being able to hit the proof points of cycle life and density improvement and power performance that's meaningful because we know it's going to take five to 10 years to get into a commercial product. And so if you're targeting a modest improvement, that's great, but it's probably not a venture style investment. You need to be targeting something that's three, five, 10 times better so that by the time you get there, it's still meaningful and it still matters. Um, the, the other thing I would just maybe chime in on from a manufacturing standpoint, just to reflect backwards a bit, I, for better or worse, spent some time in Washington, D.C., advising entrepreneurs during the 2009 stimulus that came about. And, you know, a couple of things back then, there was a real attempt, I think, to stand up a domestic battery manufacturing industry. But I think there was a big disconnect between the market pull and the supply push that folks were trying to enable. So, you know, funding folks like A123 and Johnson Controls um, was great. Uh, Having the the automotive loan guarantee program to support the retooling of 
the uh, automotive industry and fund folks like Tesla was great. But one thing that was challenging is that the demand from the market for EVs is not what it was today. The commitment that the automakers have made um, is recent. And so hopefully from a timing perspective, we're in a much better position to really bolster the manufacturing base domestically um, and, you know, and pull this through. Great. No, appreciate uh, appreciate that answer. And Depender wants to comment. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, uh, you know, one thing I agree with what Sarah said. And, you know, since she spent time in D.C., I think it's really important uh, for us to, as a community, send some of these uh, messages to the policymakers because the policymakers are trying to basically deploy a lot of capital very, very quickly. So if you look at their goal is to get the money out in the quickest way possible. And so, you know, the first reaction is how do we provide money to people to buy? That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to encourage manufacturing. Uh, so where the money is directed becomes a really important signal uh, to people. And uh, if all the money is going to be here, you know, here's a check, go spend it and buy something, uh, that is just going to go buy whatever is available. I mean, we all saw uh, another version of automotive policy a few years ago where every car manufacturer suddenly started building SUVs that were more than 4,000 pounds, if I remember correctly, was the magic number, completely um, backfired, right? All of a sudden, everybody started building cars that were over 4,000 pounds because there was, a, there, was, there was a stimulus that said, go buy trucks or go buy industrial, you know, industrial automotive uh, trucks. And what, what you got were you know, a bunch of BMW SUVs and Mercedes SUVs, which were all over, over 4,000 pounds. So all that to say that I think when, when, when we're making uh, some of these policies today, uh, we have to be very, very careful about that. And we have a lot of money that is being planned uh, so uh, as much as we can do as a community to encourage uh, the direction of that of that money, where you can you can do this, you, ha you can have the same effect by encouraging manufacturing, by lowering the cost of manufacturing, by lowering the cost of the products, um, uh, where 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 people will benefit from a from a lower cost. And on that lower cost uh, node, um, something that is surprising uh, that, you've, that you've probably seen is venture interest in battery recycling. Like who would have imagined a few years ago that there would be venture interest in any type of recycling? Uh, forget about manufacturing, but recycling. And it's one of the areas we are the most, most excited about because I think as a couple of panelists said earlier, uh, what better than having reuse of the same material that you've built entire fleets of and not having to go dig for more uh, it is going to be better for you from an environmental footprint point of view it's going to be better for you from a cost point of view it's going to be better for you from a cycle time point of view it's going to be better for you from an energy security point of view it's just um, you know some a, a no-brainer and uh, for something as old as recycling, uh, we're starting to see some very exciting developments and companies coming out that are uh, that are going to transform something as boring as recycling. Thank you, Dipender. Appreciate your uh, tie-in with policy to recycling uh, and innovation. Uh, very fascinating. Uh, Yen, your thoughts? Uh, we, we have to move on to the next question. Arlene, we'll, we'll give you a longer uh, uh, spell for the second one, but uh, Yen, parting thoughts for the manufacturing piece and recycling. Yeah, yeah like uh, so when I like uh, start like uh, working on both, I actually I have been working on both recycling and uh, dry manufacturing almost uh, like ten years. Actually, when I start those topics like uh, battery field, they are not interested. So typically, I go to ECS meeting. So sometimes I have three audience, five audience. Surely probably knows. Yeah, like uh, so. Like I just want want to work something like uh, for the long term. And uh, luckily now, like uh, I think is right topic, and the people are very excited for both recycling and the joint manufacturing now. 
And actually for the drug manufacturer, I invite like uh, one person from A123 and uh, she mentioned like uh, the drying is the pain for industry 10 years ago. Like uh, let's start, like uh, I was start like uh, thinking and working on a topic. Appreciate the thoughts and talking about long-term uh, brings us to uh, the, the second question here. Uh, having just taken, uh, 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 shall we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Having just taken a good deep dive into the near-term innovation and uh, their implications, let's shift our focus to our uh, second question of the day. Uh, panelists, please see the chat on the right-hand side of your screen. Again, for the link to your answer, what do you think is going to be the most challenging innovation that will disrupt the market in 10 years. Let us spend some time discussing these now. The poll begins now. All right, we have about 52 seconds. Let's hope that we're gonna get started on these. Uh, the next disruption in that's gonna come in in 10 years. All right, we need to see some answers. Uh, I'm not so certain. All right, there you go. Uh, I'm seeing battery recycling, long duration energy storage, hydrogen, solid state, uh, lithium anodes, uh, lithium free, getting away from nickel and cobalt, uh, grid scale energy storage, uh, every household, how to use lithium metal, sustainability of battery industry, efficient manufacturing comes coming back to manufacturing it looks like all right the poll is closed now great i think we're gonna get started on um, another uh fascinating discussion here all right let's go from uh shirley this time Yeah, so I have uh, shared my vision. I think uh, uh, at least uh, in my vision for the future, um, every household should have a refrigerator for electrons. So remember we have a refrigerator for our food and energy is absolutely necessary for our daily life. So um, I do think that, uh, you know, if you think about the batteries as uh, something uh, that will really, um, you know, uh, improve the quality of life. I mean, I'm in California and we're always threatened by cutting off our power lines because uh, there's a wildfire uh, um, warnings, right? So that should never happen in a developed country like the United States. So if I do have the storage capacity in my household, uh, that will be really awesome. And I think uh, states like uh, Texas mm -hmm. and uh, you know New York, we all have uh, you know, to build the resilience towards cr climate crisis. So, um, you know, regardless if, um, you know, the battery technology, uh, I foresee lithium will not be the only choice. In fact, we will run out of lithium if we electrify 2 billion cars. We will have to enable sodium-based or zinc-based batteries. So all these are connected to eventually enable grid storage or home-based uh, um, batteries that every household will have. And I think, uh, to take that kind of top-down approach will be much more inspiring for the battery community uh, and also the investment community because we're really thinking about what the customers, what the people want, what the people will enjoy if they do have that technology. So uh, from my perspective, that's always how I decide what research topics I should be focusing on. Uh, and I think it's so important that we uh, all working towards a holistic approach to think about, uh, uh, you know, if we want the resilience towards the climate crisis, what are needed? So, you know, um, really that uh, the extreme weathers in the recent years, uh, you know, we should prepare uh, for our, everybody should have this kind of emergency plans uh, for a refrigerator for electrons. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Arlene, uh, we'll give you uh, the second spot now uh, because uh, apologies, we couldn't uh, get to you on the second side, uh, second part of the first one. No, I promise my answer will be much shorter this time. So, um, I, you know, I, 
my first answer is adaptable manufacturing, just going along with my previous answer to the last question, which is materials economics in particular is, is hard to predict. So being able to switch materials um, and designing your manufacturing up front for, to enable that um, to account for these changes in, in economics and availability of materials. But um, since I do, I do R and D. Of course, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just throw out some, some materials. And Defender, uh, you know, gave my top answer, which is, is solid state. Um, I think that's, that's where we're going in the next 10 years. Um, you know, lithium anode and, and beyond lithium anode, sodium anode or sodium free or lithium free, um, are, are, are also, um, feasible things. And then on the cathode side, um, I think even in the best recycling situation, um, given the energy growth and the energy refrigerators that Shirley is going to implement in every household, um, we're going to run out of, you know, some of the nickel uh, cobalt uh, materials that we're trying to implement today. And we're going to have to come up with a, a long lifetime um, material solution for uh, materials that, you know, use lithium and sulfur and other things that that we have a plenty in um, available. Thank you, Arlene. I'm sure uh, other panelists would like to chime in here. Uh, perhaps we can uh, go with uh, Yen. Yeah. My my top three choice is uh, like a uh, lithium metal, including other metal anode. Uh, because right now, like in order to develop like a higher energy density batteries, like a metal anode, that's one option. And uh, it can be solid state or liquid state or like a semi-solid. People, uh, some companies, they are doing like, a, they add like a uh, very sm small amount of electrolyte to solve the interface issue uh, of those solid-solid interface. Um, to me, it's not clear like which option will go to the, uh, will, will be the winner. But like a metal anode, definitely like uh, people, I think, uh, like uh, should be developed. The other one is like um, I, I wrote is a sustainability of the industry, and uh, as like a previous panelist said, like uh, the resource is limited, right? So like uh, the main elements we need for lithium batteries, uh, like lithium, nickel, or cobalt, is like uh, just like uh, is uh, we have limited resource. If based on the prediction, maybe by two thousand and fifty some like of the elements will, will be used up. I think like uh, how to recover, high efficiently recover those uh, resources is also important. It's also important for, for, the, uh, for the whole industry. And uh, the last thing is like, uh, uh, I think uh, still manufacture. I, I do believe like uh, manufacture is the key to convert like those raw materials or elements to the final products. I, I actually think like uh, less the most US lack of, you know, so so each year we see like in the US, we have many, many battery stocks and maybe after five years, either gone or like lost technology transferred to other countries, you know, like, uh, but currently like the major battery manufacturers is like a South Korean company or Japanese company, you know, like uh, in, even in, in US. So like, uh, I, I think we do need to develop like a, uh, Manufacturing, so like how to make batteries more efficiently, lower cost, uh, maybe better performance, like a lower carbon footprint. Uh, I think those things. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate your your thoughts here. Uh, we can go to Bob. Sure, Anil. Uh, I believe that the next major electrochemistry uh, that is on the horizon hasn't been invented yet and in within the next 10 years with as much money as being thrown at batteries and as many researchers that are working on batteries i believe we're going to see some new major uh, perturbation if you will of electric chemistry that we just haven't even seen yet it took us 44 years to go from bench top to actual widespread adoption of lithium batteries just got to stop and think about that for a minute. 44 years. I can remember hiring into Del Corimi division of General Motors as a young scientist. And uh, I kept hearing this buzzword about lithium. Well, lithium this and lithium that. I just happened to be working on silver zinc batteries at the time for the Man at Man missile program. 
So it was uh, quite fascinating to me when Dr. John Warner, a good friend of mine who's got the, I think he's the only guy on the planet who's written two full books on lithium batteries, uh, did a chart for me that I used at the battery show four years ago that told us that 44 year window. So I guess I, I have to I just kind of shorten my answer a little bit by saying, I'm waiting for that next major breakthrough by some young whippersnapper in a university or an industry that will come up with a brand new battery technology that will, number one, have available resources that we don't have to go dig so much out of the ground or pump it out of the brine and implement it in such a way that it'll be uh, uh, cost effective, fully recyclable, and in a way that we can value it. Because I've got a, I've got a motto, and uh, uh, Shirley heard this this morning, turning technology into cash. Technology by itself is not a lot of value to mankind. But if you can turn that technology into cash, that's really value to the man, mankind. Thank you, Bob. Just a clarification question for you. Um, are you thinking more in the grid scale or more like something that would replace hydroelectric power? Or are you thinking more in like uh, the, still in the, in the cars and, and et cetera, more like iron or something that's more available? On planet Earth, that could be sort of more sustainable. Is that is that where you're going? <laughs> and Neil, I, uh, there's just one funny story about they found some old Edison cells in Detroit. They dumped the electrolyte out, put new electrolyte in it. Damn things still work. They still had about eighty to eighty-five percent of the rating capacity after they sat around for a hundred years. So you know, there's a lot of old technology still sitting on the shelf. I, you know, I was uh, uh, the guy that made a lot of money off of lead acid batteries for GM back in the day. But I have to tell you, lead acid isn't dead. It's still a good technology. Uh, but to maybe uh, to, to shorten up my answer just a little bit, I think every electrochemistry that we know today has its market niche. It isn't all just lithium. Nickel zinc battery is making a big comeback, particularly in uh, server farms, in uh, military applications, places where lithium just doesn't fit real well because the temperature profile of lithium isn't as good as either a lead acid or an, uh, a nickel-based chemistry, as an example. Thank you. That's very, very exciting and interesting. Dipender? I, I didn't think uh, we would talk about Edison's batteries, but it's really funny. We found some of them. And uh, I completely agree, Bob. Uh, we, we have a team that took those batteries and, and uh, you know, got the dust off of them, and sure enough, uh, they came back to life. So, you know, those those chemistries that have existed for a while, I think, could play an interesting role, especially in long, long life, uh, low LCOS, if you may, because they're just so easy to make and uh, very, very cheap, uh, even manufacturing capacity. Uh, uh, for um, for a, a comment that came up earlier, by the way, Anil, I figured out, I think if you go later, it's so much easier because then you can comment on a bunch <laughs> of stuff. Um, uh, lithium metal, I think, you know, lithium metal is just uh, impossible to ignore, right? Uh, and by the way, when I said solid state uh, in the first section, I meant with lithium metal because I think as long as the, the uh, you know, the uh, lithium remains on the top left, corner uh, of our elements, uh, it's going to be the one, right, uh, that everybody needs to shoot for. And so uh, lithium metal, I think, is just math when it comes to things like volumetric density or, or, or you know, density, energy density, period. Uh, so that will be, that will be the, the short-term focus. And then it's just a question, as you can tell, you know, some of us have something in the first five years versus 10 years. But when you're when you're bringing it all together, those answers are almost almost uh, overlapping. Um, shifting to application uh, and then what is driven by that, uh, I think long duration storage is something that is getting redefined. You know, used to be that people used to consider eight hour or 10 hour long duration. And, and uh, I guess it's it's all relative. But I think long duration uh, where you get days and hopefully weeks is uh, another front. And I think that becomes interesting in the next 10 years. I think we're already seeing uh, 
lots of fun things that are starting there, but it's clearly the begin. you know, it's sort of early days, uh, but uh, we're starting to see uh, ideas that seem very, very viable in the next few years. And uh, that becomes so important for that last uh, excuse and argument people have for adopting renewables, which is, you know, what do I do uh, from, a, from a storage point of view? And so I think you're going to start seeing long duration ideas, uh, more ideas coming forward, and you'll, you're going to start seeing more uh, commercial contracts coming up for people wanting to try those. And then, of course, the last one, as I mentioned earlier, uh, hydrogen, I think, plays a big role in, uh, in the next few years. Uh, it's not, obviously, it's not mysterious how, how you make hydrogen. The question is, how do you scale it? How do you build uh, better electrolyzers? How do you get it down to a cost where it's interesting? The application for hydrogen, unlike many other things that we invest in, are so many, right, that it's a very forgiving space. You can start off with making fertilizer, you can go to steel, and then you can get to transportation. And in transportation, you have this big gaping hole of aviation that no batteries are really going to address from a long distance point of view. Short distance aviation, you know, we, we are, we're doing short distance aviation with, with electric uh, drivetrains and batteries, and those are perfect. But for long distance aviation, which is, you know, a, a lot of what people think of when they see big planes, or shipping for that matter. Uh, and then the battery recycling one was in that same category, Anil, which was five years versus 10 years. For me, it's a bigger thing in 10 years, not because it doesn't exist. It obviously exists today. Uh, we are thrilled to be part of Redwood, which was full circle for us, given you know one of the founders of Tesla said, what's the most important next thing to do once I've built the best electric car? It's to go recycle uh, them as opposed to go on and build something else. And so the reason why I picked that in 10 years is not because it doesn't exist today. It's that think of when recycling will really start at volume is when those cars start dying. And hopefully that's not in the next three, four years. That really starts happening in the next, you know, 8, 10, 15, 20 years when the large volumes of cars start coming back. And then the scale, scale up of recycling is, is really going to be fun. Perhaps that's the inflection we need for manufacturing as well uh, to to build up a much bigger manufacturing or uh, one uh, one giga uh, gigafactory a day or something like I that. I hope uh, I hope it's not a chicken and egg thing. I think manufacturing has to happen uh, at scale before those batteries need to recycle because I think we need to make a lot of them uh, so that we can get a lot of them back to recycle. So I, I hope we don't wait till recycling. We're till we're recycling cars in 10 years to start manufacturing. I hope we start manufacturing right away. Thank you for your feedback. Appreciate it. Sarah. So many good comments and thoughts. Um, so I'll try to add some, some additional commentary. So I think in 10 years, I think there's still a lot of, um, opportunity in the, with lithium based platforms. Um, you know, we can't forget that we've been innovating and iterating on this particular chemistry platform for 20 plus years. And so there's still a lot of room, especially as you look at the cost declines over the last 10 years, they've started to decelerate and flatten out as we've reached economies of scale. The performance improvements will continue. And I think to achieve more dramatic performance improvements, it's going to require continued focus. Um, so we're excited about, you know, the investments and the companies in our portfolio that fit into those categories on both anode and cathode. And on the cathode side, you know, or coding side, I should say more generally, which could apply to either, you know, part of the battery. Um, I think uh, Arlene alluded to this sort of cycle, sales cycle, product development cycle challenge, which, um, you know, if you're planning two, two to three years for out for not just battery manufacturing facilities, but also launching your next generation or your next iteration of a particular battery chemistry or formulation, um, really to get some of these new coding enhancements baked into the product, it could take 10 years. I think what's exciting for us is to see the potential for technologies that have a net performance or 
cost improvement, um, where it doesn't actually add because it's a, a material sort of tweak or a manipulation. It doesn't require a significant amount of CapEx, and it results in a net positive performance gain on a cost per kilowatt hour basis. That is exciting, and I think something that we hope to see come to fruition. Um, on long duration storage, I think it is quite interesting. Um, we're very focused on this space. We made an investment about two years ago, and the um, the news and the media is getting quite hyped, which is, I think, good for the ecosystem support. I think it's important to see the apples to apples comparisons and make sure that you know some of the numbers and the targets that folks are quoting are being done on an apples to apples basis, because oftentimes it's not, and it's hard to sort of dissect. Um, is this, you know, are they talking about the all in, all in system cost? Um, really, what's that levelized cost of storage? So if we can get to a point where we're at a levelized cost of storage, sub 20 bucks kilowatt hour for a longer duration, I think that's a pretty interesting place to be. And there are a number of companies that are chasing that and are moving down the path to achieve that. Um, and I think, Anil, you asked the question of what can the ecosystem do to engage and pull through these materials innovations? And really, it's just that. It's engage. Talk to these entrepreneurs about your specifications, about your footprint, footprint requirements, about your, um, your testing cycles, the sort of duty on performance that you expect to achieve before you'll put meaningful commitment behind some of these innovations, because that will help guide, engage, and help these entrepreneurs determine how they can capitalize, how they can pull their products through, um, and how best to fund themselves and engage with investors and the, the, the folks that can provide non-dilutive capital. Thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate it. I think uh, one thing that uh, would be um, very interesting to hear from the panelists is the um, the play of machine learning and AI in, in all of this. Uh, uh, does anyone uh, have any comments uh, that they would like to make uh, in this space? AI is definitely not my expertise, but uh, you know, I think I think eventually it will be kind of critical. Um, and the faster that we can develop product um, and process QC that we can integrate in a learning fashion, so that you know we can do machine response, um, that'll be helpful. Um, there's a lot of research out of the national labs using AI for materials development, and I think that's that's fascinating and interesting if we can um, facilitate faster materials development, particularly towards reliability and, you know, long-term stability, um, which isn't an easy thing to test on a fast moving um, uh, materials development cycle. Um, those are some of the things off the top of my head that I see AI being particularly useful for. But Thank I think the, the more the more factories we build, the more uh, processing we do, inevitably, um, this will be integrated more and more. Thank you. Maybe I can draw a, a strange analogy from the pharmaceutical industry because there's a lot of work that is going on in the pharmaceutical industry to fasten or, or, or make drug development faster. Is there something that we could adopt as a community to test these materials, test these things faster, and, and potentially provide like platforms for academ academia uh, or scientists to, to uh, make newer technologies come faster that are cheaper and more sustainable. Have any of you seen any uh, sort of marketplaces and, and interesting ideas in the space? Uh, I'd <laughs> love to hear uh, more thoughts from you. Oh, for sure, Neil. The uh, large battery manufacturers are already doing what you're talking about. They're already using the, yeah, you can go, I live here in Indiana, near Indianapolis, and you can go down to Eli Lilly and watch the guys do the pharmaceutical uh, analysis. They're using the same molecular modeling technologies as what the battery manufacturers are working with to develop new, uh, new materials in their development. So when you start looking at interstitial spaces, particular intercalation chemistries, how you determine the right size, the right kind of molecular structure to get those kind of uh, 
um, uh, placements, if you will, of the ions into the active materials. Uh, clearly, this is just simple stick modeling, if you want to call it that, using eigenfunctions in, in uh, mathematical equations. So it's not rocket science. It's just needs a smart chemist to know what he's doing to figure out how to do it. And to another point that was uh, being made a moment ago, when you start looking at artificial intelligence and manufacturing process, my uh, dear friend Robin Zung made a comment uh, two weeks ago when he was talking on the World Economic Forum that there's over 3,600 control points in making a battery technology in one of the plants. Think about that for a minute. Very, so, very insightful. So, Anil, I can, I can also comment on your question about partnerships that are out there and models for partnering. Um, we've seen a couple of things work well. Number one is a number of the national labs have these incubator sort of fellowship programs where they're actually funding external innovators to come in and use the lab and as their playground for two years. They fund, you know, one to two people, three to four teams each cycle, and they have access to all the lab's resources, which is a huge, you know, barrier for a lot of these early stage companies to have access to some of the manufacturing equipment, the testing equipment, and also the expertise and the talent that's been doing research in these areas for decades. So those are great programs. I'm on the advisory board for Chain Reaction Innovations, which is the Argonne program, um, and there are many others. The other model that we've seen work well is for large corporations to begin engaging with entrepreneurs. You know, More and more corporations have their own corporate venture group, which is fantastic. Um, they also, in the business units, are starting to collaborate more directly with joint development agreements where they'll actually fund some of that um, product development because sometimes entrepreneurs can just move a bit faster if there's a more narrow scope and a focused, ex focused area that they want to plug into their activities. They can do that in a fairly cost-effective way. And it's great for the entrepreneurs because they really start to understand what pain points they're solving for. So... Those are two models that um, that we've seen that work quite well, especially at the very, very early stage, which is where we invest sort of first institutional capital. Thank you, Sarah. That's very interesting indeed. Shirley? Yeah, I will add a few points here. Um, I agree with what Bob and Sarah have said. Um, actually, there's an interesting fact uh, that uh, I uh, my PhD thesis, I was actually, uh, you know, um, in 2005, um, the title is Combining App Initial Computation with Experiments for Designing High Energy Density Electrode Materials for Advanced Lithium Batteries. Um, so I remember in early 2000, that we are desperately looking for substitutions of cobalt because we were already imagining that electrification of cars will happen right away. And we're looking for elements that will replace um, cobalt and the you know, guess what elements come out? Number one, nickel. Number two, manganese. Those are coming from computational studies because my PhD advisor, Professor Gilbert Cedar, is somebody who does not make any materials in the lab. He makes materials on the computer. So I think that uh, um, really kickstarted the United States materials genome program because everybody knows that the human genome programs, that it's a global cooperations for decipher the mysterious things about human bodies. And I think uh, uh, in the next 10 years, in fact, it's very exciting that uh, uh, materials community are going to actually adopt this approach about the finding materials genome. So we really need to find the descriptors for things like, you know, if you want to allow in fast charging, can you find a materials that can host the sodium lithium ions, uh, very large quantity, but there's no volume change. Then you can actually do fast charging many, many times. I'm just giving a simple examples here where you want to find the genome that actually enable the properties, the performances that you're looking for. So I think that, uh, you know, no doubt, uh, um, you know, machine learning AI, they are all, um, one of these tools and actually uh, for me personally 
the uh, first principles computation is more attractive uh, from the perspective of you know uh, discovery of new exciting new materials. Uh, while we're dealing with the data, I think uh, as a material scientist, I just want to caution a lot of the data scientists that the domain knowledge is the key. That when we are labeling the data, that the communication between battery experts and the data experts are so necessary. So naturally, we will have an interdisciplinary team to work on machine learning, uh, you know, data and uh, all these uh, wonderful things. I think uh, uh, to me that, uh, uh, you know, just the one word of caution when AI and the machine learning become the buzzwords, that it is very, very important uh, to realize that uh, you know, machine learning is still invented by humans, like operated by humans. Eventually, hopefully, they outperform humans. However, um, the labeling of the data and the categorization of the data, finding, you know, causality instead of correlations, I think these are so critical for the scientific community that we need to be a bit cautious about being carried away by just using, you know, software to try to replace uh, the brains. I think that's something I learned uh, invaluable advice from my former advisor that uh, computation and data science are not used to you know, uh, help us not thinking and to help us accelerating the discovery of new things. So I personally, you know, really like your question. I think uh, this is something not just for the battery field, but for hydrogen storage. You know, think about the last 20 years, where are the breakthrough for hydrogen storage? And now we need to deploy the hi hydrogen um, technology. We really need to discover better hydrogen storage materials. And I think uh, um, first principle calculations, machine, machine learning, AI, these are all necessary tools to be deployed. Certainly, we're seeing um, many companies that are also discovering new catalysts for um, hydrogen um, uh, generation for electrolyzers and so on. Um, certainly, there's a huge play of techno economics, um, and uh, this is where we believe that there's going to be potential uh, disruptions as well. But really appreciate uh, uh, your inputs here. Uh, perhaps it's a uh, time for us to move on to the next stage of our um, of our uh, uh, discussion today. We will uh, open up the floor for uh, uh, the audience. Uh, now is the time to uh, for the audience to get your cell phone ready to scan your QR code or get another browser ready as uh, you'll be able to uh, vote on the answer and uh, uh, on, on each of these discussions that you just heard about. Um, as you see the QR code coming up on your screen, you should also be able to find the link uh, in the in the chat section uh, on the right hand side um, so, uh, to get the polling. Uh, you should be asked uh, which where where are you coming from, uh, which industry, which sector uh, are you coming from? Because we want to be able to understand uh, the answers on 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 where where you are um, uh, located uh, in that. Great. We have about 19 seconds uh, left. So let's continue. It looks like we have a very nice, even um, uh, distribution here, about 25% startup, 30% academia, about uh, less uh, investors and more industry. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, I'm very excited to see the poll actually uh, myself. So uh, right. It looks like the Voting is closed. Okay, quick results here. 32% um, academia, 29% industry, about 15% uh, VCs and investors, and about 18% startup and other as 5%. Well, thank you very much for that, um, for this uh, quick voting poll, and maybe we'll go to the next part of this. Um, uh, let's get the answers from the, uh, from each of the audience members on uh, uh, what they think is the most impactful innovation in the next five years. Um, wow, okay, it looks like we have uh, several people voting, 44% uh, um, and uh, some in dry electrode. Um, uh, excellent, mm -hmm. looks like, uh, uh, wow. 
31%. All right, we're getting a tiebreaker here. All right, uh, last 10 seconds, uh, audience members. Looks like uh, we have um, solid state uh, going down a little bit. All right, let's go last few seconds. All right, the voting is closed for the next five years. Great, and let's go with our next poll on the same question that is gonna be on the disruption uh, in the market in 10 years. Audience, uh, let's see what the audience will say on this. The letters are really small, I can't really see, but uh, <laughs> all right, <laughs> thank you. Uh, right, uh, battery recycling seems to be a big one. All right, hydrogen is coming up and solid state is still quite high. Um, wow, battery recycling, uh, long duration energy storage, uh, solid state. We have an even distribution now, last 10 seconds. Um, looks like uh, uh, dry coating and dry processing both really in the same similar category, but certainly uh, taking a big one here. Excellent. Last few seconds, audience. Well, really appreciate your uh, polling here. Thank you so much. So maybe uh, uh, we can bring up the first uh, results of the poll on the next five years. And uh, perhaps we can sit down and just uh, uh, think about uh, what the audience thinks. And uh, uh, it, can we make the uh, graph a little bigger, please? Thank you. So, all right, we have a winner on this. It looks like silicon anodes uh, is, is the one that uh, got the highest votes. Um, uh, any comments from, uh, from the panel members here on uh, silicon anodes? I think what's more important, interesting is that uh, um, academics think that silicon anodes uh, for sure are, are, are more prevalent uh, uh, in the next five years. But uh, from the industry perspective, uh, they think, uh, I guess, silicon anodes and solid state are a little bit of a tiebreaker. Maybe we can have one of the academics uh, analyze this data <laughs> for us and then tell us what, what they think. Uh, I don't know, Shirley, do you want to you take a stab at this? Thank you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, it's a very reasonable uh, polling. Uh, I do think that silicon, uh, I mean, I'm a little bit biased because I've just made a breakthrough in silicon for solid state. So it's win-win. It's either li liquid or solid state that uh, they will, you know, um, like really taking off in either technologies. So I'm very, very excited for the future of silicon. You know, one of the, point we pointed out about the low carbon foot, foot, footprint, uh, the graphite, uh, you know, particularly the, the graphite, high end graphite, they actually have pretty high carbon footprint. So for me, the field moving towards silicon and the lithium metal, it's not just for performance reason, also for the sustainability of the tech, lithium battery technology. So very happy to see this polling results. Great. Thank you. And Arlene, your, your thoughts on this? Shall we bring up the polling results again, please? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm similarly uh, invested in all of those technologies. Uh, you know, at Forgeano, we do coatings for silicon anodes and solid state, and you know, we enable dry coating, and we even do uh, coatings for three D printing. So I'm happy with any of those answers. Um, you know, I think I, I think Shirley's answer or is is great. Um, the Silicon is already being integrated in graphite. They're showing, you know, capacity gains. Solid state's right on its tails. Um, trying to reduce the cost of manufacturing is is a huge undertaking while also launching kind of um, a battery industry. Um, so I, I don't I don't I don't know. Like honestly, they're all good answers. Excellent. It looks like uh, the investor community is uh, somewhat bullish on uh, uh, dry dry electrode and dry printing. Uh, Depender and 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 um, Sarah actually both. 
Yeah, I think uh, the investor community can't afford to be anything but bullish. Uh, <laughs> and so <laughs> I think that goes without saying. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think, it, by the way, it would be interesting to merge the two, the, your five-year data and your 10-year results and see what uh, what the combined is. I don't know if we can do that on the fly. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but maybe you can combine it and, 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 and show it during the week. I would yeah. say uh, the good news here is, you know, uh, you have a lot of interesting activity going on across the board. Uh, these are all things that are going to be important. And uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we're going to need a lot of all of this. So uh, uh, I'm personally, as you know, very bullish on uh, the reasons for solid state uh, and especially solid state plus lithium metal. And uh, whether it's, you know, five years or 10 years, I think it's just what your vantage point is. Uh, if I remember correctly, you know, the 10 year picture on solid state improves for a lot of uh, the folks in the audience. So five years, 10 years, uh, you know, it's uh, to me, it's not that uh, that big a difference. Excellent. Um, other panelists want to chime in on the five year? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Jim. I just want to say thank you, Dependent. You are a very patient investor. We need a more investor like you. You actually said <laughs> five year and the 10 year does not make a difference to you. And uh, <laughs> I think that's exciting to hear, refreshing to hear. <laughs> well, I, you know, these are these are incredibly large markets, right? Uh, uh, this is not, uh, you know, these are not uh, million dollar markets or billion dollar markets. These are potentially trillion dollar markets in general, right? Clearly hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, and then if you multiply it by years and you multiply it by geographies, um, uh, these are your your you're basically seeing the overall overhaul of the entire energy landscape and uh, if you go back you know in time the last few hundred years right uh, those changes have happened uh, uh, and they've been big um, in the past it was wood versus oil kind of stuff and now it's now it's you know fun tech so uh, I think uh, I think these are very large markets and so uh, this will these will pay off for investors and patient investors. Wonderful. Uh, Bob, any thoughts from you as well? Well, I, I look at uh, everything from a perspective, and surely you heard this this morning, the five golden rules of electrification. And they're very important, and it's noteworthy to write them down because one of the smartest guys on the planet sat down with me and beat, up, beat me up for about two, two days. His name is Dr. Jonas Barisa. He worked at General Motors, but he was also a rocket scientist from Hughes. We came up with this list of five golden rules, and I've not found anybody that can dispute these five golden rules in this order, and it applies to almost everything we've talked about during this entire call today, and that is safety, performance, life, cost, and environmental, in that order. And the reason for that is that safety is of utmost criticality to everyone, the preservation of human life and the welfare of humans is so, so important. And anything that we talk about here, and particularly on the silicon anode technology, uh, is, is around the performance area, because all the car manufacturers are trying to get those last few ounces of electrons out of that battery pack so they can get that extra, extra bit of range. But all of the scientists that are on the call know that the silicon and the graphite discharge at a different voltage, right? So that's an important differential in the performance aspect. Then the life expectancy is, is something uh, that I think uh, I heard Hender talking about earlier. The total cost of ownership is very important. And this also relates back to the, uh, the, the results of your survey that you just took. People are looking at that from a standpoint of what is my total cost of ownership? And depending upon what the cost of the raw materials is that go into it, and the value that you get from it is quite can be quite different, but we have a common goal there. Now the next one is is very very onerous, and that is cost. Uh, Tesla has been able to sell the heck out of their cars because they've got the the green revolution behind them. There's no question about it. But as we move into newer revolution, if you will, of uh, technologies, people need to be able to afford these electric cars that are in the mid-range and lower range of income. 
that is where the cost is really going to come into play. And then the last one we've talked about quite a bit, and it's showing up in our surveys, that recycling, environmental aspects are very important. We need to preserve those uh, very important minerals that we dump into these batteries to get the electrons stored. So those are the five golden rules, Anil, and I just thought it would be very important to point that out during our call sometime. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I think uh, it is definitely time for us to move to the next section. Uh, I wish I could talk about LFP. I wish I could talk about a lot more. Uh, actually, uh, Sarah had one more point. Maybe Sarah? Sure, and I'll, I'll keep it brief. I think just on the notion of, of this time horizon, five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, I think what What's exciting is, at least as far as we look at it, we really are looking for technology moats because if you have a real competitive advantage in your technology innovation, it, it gives you time. It gives you time to get to market and to penetrate so that you know by the time you get there, your innovation and your technology is meaningful. I think what we see with, a, with some of the silicon anode platforms is that you know, the maximum potential of silicon anode technology is, is 10 times better capacity. But really where industry has started to adopt it slowly is not taking it to that full maximum potential. It's sort of baby stepping into improvements that on the surface may seem a bit more incremental, but in the at the end, as they continue to improve on all these other facets, some of which Bob mentioned, then we get a, closer and closer to reaching that theoretical maximum potential in time. Thank you for sharing that, um, Sarah. So perhaps we can uh, uh, let's get back to the slide deck. Uh, it is uh, really, really amazing that I we heard all of these. Uh, uh, wonderful insights from our uh, panelists. Um, we want to make sure that we do get some of the audience questions in. Uh, let's spend the next uh, about 20, 25 minutes, uh, hopefully uh, longer, but definitely we'll spend the next 20 minutes on uh, audience questions. Uh, so um, perhaps we can start uh, popping out some of the questions that we're getting from the audience here. All right, there we go. We get the first question. When will solid state chemistry really come to fruition based on the current maturity level? Seems like someone's a contrarian here. <laughs> maybe maybe we can ask uh, Depender this. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, remember investors are the optimists. Um, so I think uh, I think they come to fruition in the next within the next five years, and uh, then it's a question of scaling, and uh, and getting getting lots of manufacturing capacity built, and and then the continuous improvement from there. But I think the fundamental problem, the fundamental challenges, uh, have been have been solved. Now it's an engineering and manufacturing journey from here. Excellent. Excellent. That's very exciting. Yes. Um, so we have our next question here. What is the biggest challenge in adopting a new manufacturing process technology? Would the current OEMs be willing to change their processes? This probably is a good question for Bob. Okay. Put your put yourself in the shoes of an automotive guy that is so risk averse. You go changing any process, you got to revalidate it, okay? <laughs> They're not going to go put uh, a new infant in the back seat of a car along with its grandparent and expect that car to crash into a tree or a concrete abutment without proper validation. So no matter how easy it sounds like a process change is made, it really has to be validated because you really don't know until you've made those changes just how impactful it is on the overall uh, behavior of the battery system. Thank you so much. Appreciate the, the answer, Bob. Next question. Why can't we use metal air batteries? A lot less technical risk and doesn't require rare elements. Perhaps a good question for Yen. 
or, or anyone else happy to answer please yeah like uh, like uh, anil can i answer the last question first yes if yes you... yes please so like uh so we talk to like many uh, auto OEMs and also battery companies uh, ask them the opinion to change to the uh, dry electrode manufacturing. Actually, uh, surprisingly, most of them like uh, they are willing to change, but of course they need to see the technology to be mature enough. Uh, I think like uh, if there's benefits, my, 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 what I want to say is like, if they see the benefits, they are willing to change. They are willing to scrap their current like a uh, coding equipment actually. And uh, in terms of uh, metal air batteries, uh, and uh, a few years ago, probably uh, maybe uh, eight, 10 years ago, like uh, US did like uh, have lots of program like uh, from RPE from different DOE program uh, sponsored like uh, metal air batteries, uh, lithium air batteries. Like uh, I think like uh, people know like uh, the technical difficulties to make uh, those technology mature enough I, I think now like uh, there's less interest for those metal air batteries less as far as i know yeah looks like depender wants to chime in on the metal air sure um so uh, i think uh, the answer is the people are uh, developing metal air batteries and uh, uh, it depends on the application so i think the question said why can't we use metal air batteries my guess is you may be saying, why can't we use metal air batteries in cars or, or transportation? And there it comes down to, what do you need? Uh, you heard me talk about the five things at the beginning of the hour, right? It's energy density, power density, cycle life, safety, and cost. And uh, there, you, know, you, could, you, could, you could create those spider diagrams and say which applications can survive what. Uh, clearly, transportation and mobility is the is the least forgiving because of a variety of things and how many of those five are needed. There are other applications where it's less of an issue or for a period of time, there is uh, uh, you know, the, the price uh, that the market is willing to pay is higher or different. So uh, the short answer would be people are using and developing and have plans for metal air batteries. Uh, they do play a role uh, in the landscape uh, over the next decade uh, or two decades or more um, and uh, in terms of when they start scaling up. And then uh, uh, you'll start seeing uh, uh, especially metal air showing up in the long duration market uh, to begin with because of the point that Sarah made earlier, which is they will tend to be the lowest cost per kilowatt, which is very important as opposed to kilowatt hour. Everybody's used to talking about kilowatt hours because that's what we pay for electricity. And we've always measured uh, the, the goodness of batteries from a kilowatt hour point of view. But when you're building long duration storage, you also have to worry about cost per kilowatt, which is how much does it cost you to build? Thank you. Thank you, Depender, on uh, chiming in there on the CapEx side. Uh, Perhaps to add on to that, there's one more question here, something related to that, is when will you be building um, green energy storage without an iota of fossil fuel energy? So I think, uh, again, that's a trend that is uh, absolutely starting. And the reason for that is very simple, that what we call green energy today is very soon going to be the cheapest energy, period. Um, in most parts of the world where you can have solar, uh, where the sun shines, solar is very cheap and you'll start seeing people using more and more solar. Uh, where, you know, some of us are based here in California, the growth in solar has been, has been tremendous. Obviously, China, the growth has been tremendous. But so I think that answer will be more tied to when, the, when do renewables and green energy uh, phase out or phase in while the fossil fuel energy plants phase out and that uh, transition is happening and is happening with uh, quite a bit of speed and momentum in many geographies. Um, I would uh, uh, use this opportunity to talk about hydrogen. Um, what you're going to see most likely is most hydrogen generation will be tied to green energy because of the, again, the lower cost of energy. In fact, I would say, this can be a topic for another panel someday, Anil, is 
in the future, you may have dedicated solar or wind energy generation that is tied pretty much for uh, hydrogen generation um, because you can also then think of it as as sort of the ultimate uh, long duration battery in some ways as well um, using really cheap wind or really cheap cheap solar uh, to generate hydrogen and maybe even nuclear well that's a that's a third rail right i think nuclear clearly has uh, has uh, a very popular characteristic of being very very low carbon uh, the issue is the societal concerns and the political challenges with it. And those societal concerns and political challenges with it go to the bottom line because getting a nuclear fission power plant is next to impossible. Uh, and uh, uh, the amount of project risk uh, just makes the cost of that project really, really, really expensive and difficult. Um, so, uh, even though it's a very different kind of nuclear, I would say what you're going to start seeing is the advent of fusion, uh, which is very different. I mean, people call it nuclear because it's still it's fusion of of uh, atoms as opposed to fission. Uh, uh, and again, maybe another panel another day is uh, you will see fusion uh, coming around and there's already some exciting plays in fusion. Uh, that are starting to uh, starting to appear. Thank you. I think Sarah wanted to chime in here. Um, I didn't, but I can if you would like, or maybe there's a, another question you guys want to move to. Uh, I mean, happy to happy to move to to another question for sure. Um, let's go. All right. Wow, there's a lot of questions I have to choose now. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion on which one is closer to commercialization in the long-term fusion, a hydrogen car or an all solid state battery car? That's a good question. It is a good question. I think they're, to be honest, they're both a ways away. I would say the solid state battery car comes first. I think hydrogen is interesting, but you have a whole other infrastructure challenge to solve for. Um, at the risk of being the one to say the emperor has no clothes with hydrogen, I think it's interesting. We're seeing a lot of activity there. There's a lot of hype at the moment. Um, there's various colors of hydrogen from gray and brown to blue to now green. You know, we've seen 78 hydrogen companies in the last 12 months, and uh, the bulk of them are focused on green hydrogen generation and trying to optimize for the production capability, which you know is the tip of the spear on really reaching a, a hydrogen economy where you have the right compression, storage, transportation infrastructure, and so on and so forth to support it. So I think it's, um, it's a big challenge with a lot of moving pieces. And in batteries, and at least in solid state, there's sort of a, a front of um, manufacturers, a value chain that's starting to coordinate more a slew of innovations that have been, you know, making some progress over the last decade or so. So I, I'll put my uh, my bet on that horse. Great, thank you. Arlene, if I can add, I if I can add uh, maybe one comment, Anil. Uh, I I think that might have been a bit of a trick question uh, because a hydrogen car exists. Uh, there are hydrogen cars, but I wholeheartedly agree with the spirit of Sarah's answer, which is at scale and at practical levels it'll be uh i think the solid state battery car that will uh that will succeed over a hydrogen car is my prediction uh and the reason for that is exactly what sarah said right uh, at the end of the day uh, uh, the economics and the numbers and you don't have to wait for the solid state battery car to prove that right the lithium ion battery car uh, is is far succeeding a hydrogen car. Um, and so our excitement with hydrogen, which we are very excited about, does not have to do with cars. It has to do with all the other uses of hydrogen. And in the long run, hydrogen replacing uh, uh, things in uh, industries like uh, fertilizer, steel, aviation, I mentioned, natural gas power plants, et cetera. 
but hydrogen cars. And I would say, Sarah, if your prediction is correct, um, which uh, aligns with mine, uh, if the solid state car or the lithium ion car, as we see, uh, continues to be the dominant one, then it becomes a harder and harder and harder case uh, to, to justify the hydrogen infrastructure needed for just cars. Uh, because, and I say just cars, because with the current cost curves and the performance curves of lithium ion batteries and solid state batteries, um, we are well within what consumers will need uh, for, for cars with the simple battery electrodes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Anil. To add to that, um, yeah, I think hydrogen cars win, win hands down. They already exist and they're integrated in, in certain locations. They still require a battery, so you can have the opportunity for integration of a solid state fuel cell car. Um, but the, the infrastructure is one of the key aspects to hydrogen and the car economy that that I, I think I think the better answer or the answer that everyone is is trying to give is that we all see battery vehicles as as surpassing hydrogen cars in the near term until we can solve the hydrogen distribution issue. But I like all these questions about predicting the future. This is this is good. I'll get out my crystal ball. So, Anil, I was uh, privileged to go to the ACT conference in Long Beach this year, and the ACT conference is the Advanced Clean Technologies Conference. Over one-third of the showroom floor for what we would normally call fleet operations was around hydrogen. So we keep talking about cars this and cars that, but there's a whole infrastructure uh, of uh, battery technology coupled with fuel cell technology for large rigs and for locomotives and for other large vessel type things, uh, particularly those that run in fleets. Fleet management's quite different than passenger car. So each one of these technologies has its own place in the market. So let's not just uh, jump to conclusions that hydrogen is uh, behind because guess what? I didn't see one solid state battery at the ACT conference and I looked at the showroom floor in great detail. So uh, hydrogen is uh, well-placed when it's put into fleets because, number one, it's manageable in fleets because you normally have armed guards. They're guarding the gate in uh, fleet operations because you've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of inventory sitting in those trucks or sitting in the warehouses that the trucks are shipping out. So you have custody and control of the fuel source which is one of the concerns in the public passenger car market where terrorists can get their hands on large quantities of hydrogen and use it for bad purposes. So uh, I wouldn't jump to conclusions that hydrogen is uh, necessarily behind in, uh, fuel, uh, in, in terms of uh, battery versus uh, fuel cell technology. Very interesting perspective. Thank you, Bob, for that. One question more here we have is, what are the primary manufacturing yield issues? And are they related to process variation or input material quality? Seems like a pretty uh, good question for Bob to start with. And then maybe you can go to Yen and maybe Shirley, et cetera. Uh, actually, even Erlene. Well, Anil, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that um, the person that's asking a question may have not worked at the gigawatt or terawatt level production because uh, when you start looking at engineer design scrap, typically in most battery plants, it's around 2%, if not 3%. It's designed into the system. The extra scrap that you get out of the process is typically quality control checks and or scrappage from machine jams or just flat out there's something got screwed up along the way. So typically, most what we'd call tier one battery manufacturers never have more than about three to four scrap at max. If you get uh, into the tier twos, you're typically up in the five to seven percent range, and you get into tier three, it may be even higher. So I think the, the key point here is that uh, manufacturing technologies have a certain amount of scrap built into it just because that's how the product is designed today. Doesn't mean it has to be that way in the future. 
Yeah, like I, uh, I agree with uh, what Bob said. Like uh, the the we talk to battery manufacturers, like uh, they have very low like uh, uh, scrap rate because otherwise, like those materials are pretty expensive. Seventy five percent of battery cost actually from the materials side. So like um, they have to control well, well, and uh, so for a new battery plant, like when they start like uh, the battery manufacturer, maybe the scrap rate will be higher, maybe sometimes 20%, 30%, because they have to optimize the, the, the coating precise uh, the, and also the, the other like uh, uh, battery manufacturers that, that like, uh, but once everything is, is, is smooth, I think their scrap rate is very, very low. Great. Any last thoughts from other? Uh... Oh, Shirley, uh, I think you're on mute. All right. Uh, looks like Shirley is a little bit frozen up because of her connection. Uh... All right. Looks like we'll 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 let's move on uh, because of uh, Shirley's uh, connection. Unfortunately, uh, perhaps let's go to the next question. Uh, uh, distribution of energy has a wireless method been considered? I'm not sure if uh, I understand this question yeah. very well. Uh, well, if perhaps... they're talking about if they're talking about wireless power transfer, the SAE standards, there's. I think six different standards written around wireless power transfer, uh, everything from use cases to uh, um, protocols, lang uh, language that is used between the charger and the vehicle. Um, I personally have actually seen dual 260 kilowatt chargers put on a, a passenger car bus or passenger bus in China before. So wireless power transfer is clearly there today if that's the question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> even I couldn't understand that question very well. Uh, maybe this is a, a good one. Uh, what type of cathode material will come to correspond to anode evolution, the big evolution by silicon and lithium metal? Anyone wants to take a stab at this? Maybe I can add in here, uh, if you can hear me now. <laughs> I was trying to answer the question about the, the input the materials just now actually related to cathode, the quality of the cathode, extremely important for high quality uh, batteries. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, for the future, we didn't talk too much about the cathode materials today. Um, you know, um, LFP obviously is coming back a big time because it does not have nickel or um, uh, cobalt. Um, and uh, I think there's a uh, quite a few new cat, uh, candidates like uh, the uh, 4.8 volt spinel LNMO, which is manganese rich. And we also have the high manganese rich content lithium excess layer materials, which um, had been tempted for commercialization once, not very successfully, but I think uh, in the next two years, my prediction is the field is going to see a big comeback for that materials as well because the huge um, progress made in the electrolyte development. So um, cathode materials uh, in the sulfur base, the particularly sulfur, ca uh, sulfur polymer composites offers a great opportunities for us to further lower the um, cost for the battery. So in fact, uh, uh, battery 500 consortium that I'm with, half of our time is trying to focus on enabling sulfur polymer composites to get rid of the uh, metal elements completely from the uh, future battery technologies. So I think, you know, to pair with lithium metal, well, I think a sulfur polymer will be the best choice because we don't have any lithium inside of that cathode. Uh, so we have to enable lithium metal. We don't have any choice. So I think, yeah, there's a roadmap for the cathode. Um, I briefly mentioned about a uh, few candidates, I think, uh, uh, there's a really, um, you know, the potential pathway for 500 watt hour per kilograms uh, when we move towards uh, better cathode materials. Very nice. Thank you very much, uh, Shirley. Uh, last thoughts uh, from uh, one of our panelists on this question, cathode materials.
All right. Well, if there's none, then um, this has been an amazing session. Uh, perhaps we can bring back our slides. Um, well, thank you again for all the panelists. Uh, I think we can all uh, agree that uh, we are leaving a bit smarter and more excited about the future of uh, um, energy than uh, we came in. Please, uh, let's give a huge uh, thank you to our panelists in today's session. It was a pleasure to have you join us and thank you for the deep insights into the exciting world of uh, energy transformation or EX. And uh, thank you to our awesome audience as well for the great polls. Uh, and thank you for being uh, so engaged and keeping us on our toes with uh, really great questions towards the end. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, we now have a our uh, energy transformation or EX community on both LinkedIn and WeChat. Please use the following QR codes for these uh, to join our community and share our related content. Next slide, please. It's been uh, my pleasure to host this session and we're looking forward to bringing more outstanding content at the cutting edge of energy innovation to you in the remaining four sessions of TDK Ventures Energy Week 2021. If you haven't already done so, please register to the next session on battery management systems or BMS, data analytics. Um, until then, uh, we, it, is, it is a goodbye to us. We want to uh, thank all of our um, sponsors and even partners who helped us uh, to get the word out about Energy Week. Um, and uh, we big shout out to each one of them, uh, Volta Foundation, uh, Battery Bits, Intercalation Station, um, uh, MIT Energy Week, uh, Energy Innovation Network, um, and, and many others uh, who have really been uh, helping us uh, support this. Uh, if you'd like to share uh, content about Energy Week, please feel free to use the tag hashtag Energy Week 2021 on LinkedIn. And that's it from us. Uh, everyone have a wonderful night and sayonara.